It's a beautiful day. Time drags a bit after a celebration like that. My father once told me about taking me to my first festival of the soul's dance, one summer when I was three. Apparently I was fascinated by the giant drum perched high atop its scaffolding, and toddled straight toward it through the ring of people dancing under the spell of that throbbing beat. He said it was seeing me standing there with shining eyes that first made him worry about me, wondering if I'd become the sort of person whose only goal in life is to find out where the next party is. And he was right to worry. In 1969, when I was 17, it was the Morningwood Festival, but even now, as a 32-year-old writer, I always seem to be on the lookout for new excuses, and new ways, to celebrate. The rhythm of the drum that turned me on at three linked up with the jazz of the 50s and the rock of the 60s, and in one form or another it's led me all over the planet in search of bigger and better thrills. What exactly that rhythm meant to me, I'm not sure, but I suspect it was just the promise of endless fun. There's something empty and unreal about winter in Suspo, but I found myself looking forward to it, knowing that Lady Jane and I had made a promise to go to the beach together. The day we decided on was Christmas Eve. We met at the city bus terminal. I'd soft-soaped my mother into buying me a hooded McGregor coat for the occasion by massaging her shoulders for a couple of hours and saying things like, college. Of course I'm going to college. I might even become a school teacher after all, it's in my blood. Come to think of it, mom, maybe that's why you still look so young because you teach little kids. You know what Yamada said to me the other day? He said, Ken, your mother looks just like Ingrid Bergman in For Whom the Bell Tolls. The coat was a cream-colored, double-breasted affair with a fluffy orange lining, and the rest of my outfit shoes, socks, pants, sweater was equally preppy. Grinning at myself in the mirror, I applied a handful of my father's aftershave and imagined strolling through some little fishing village in this gave up and saying, those fish they're drying in the sun, they're flying fish, surely. The locals were bound to think I came from Tokyo. Lady Jane was waiting for me in a navy blue coat and lace-up boots, a basket dangling from her arm. As I walked through the crowded terminal toward those fawn-like eyes, giving a little boy who was singing Jingle Bells a pat on the head, I thought it seemed just like a scene from a movie. If everyone could feel as I felt at that moment, dressed in my preppy sweater and McGregor coat and about to set out on a little journey with my Bambi-eyed girlfriend on Christmas Eve, all the conflicts in the world would vanish. Mellow smiles would rule the earth. Our destination was Karatsu. The bus was nearly empty. Apart from gifted, sensitive Simon and Garfinkel fans like ourselves, the only people likely to go to the beach on Christmas Eve were broke, defeated families who, unable to make it through New Year's, had decided to kill themselves. Karatsu was known for its beautiful pine woods, its beach with somewhat bigger than average waves, and its pottery. You're going to college, aren't you? I asked her. Yes. Well, I plan to. You decided where yet? I applied to Tsuda and Tokyo Women's and Tonju. I wasn't familiar with the stuff they printed in magazines about different universities, so I didn't know what Tonju stood for. From the name it sounded like a fun place, though, so I said maybe I'd apply the two. What? The angel laughed. Tonju is Tokyo Women's Junior College. I know, I'm just kidding, I said, turning crimson. Where are you going to go, though? Your class is all pre-med students, isn't it? 90%. But I don't stand a chance of getting into medical school. No. I think it would be great to be taken care of by a doctor like you. I got all shook up wondering what she meant by this. Did it include the idea of me removing her blouse and feeling her chest, or having her lie on her back and spread her legs? The image was too rich for my blood that early in the day, we hadn't even got off the bus yet, so I summoned up a picture of Adam's face and had him tell me to get my mind out of the gutter. That helped cool me down. The last stop on the bus route was in downtown Karatsu. The conductor told us they didn't go all the way to the beach in the off-season. 
I wondered if he wasn't just jealous and saying it out of spite. It was quite a walk to the beach. I started calculating. It was now 10 in the morning. We'd probably reach the sea by 10.30, which would leave us how much time at the beach. The angel's basket presumably contained our lunch, but even if we lingered over every luscious crumb of it, we'd still have hours to kill. We'd start to freeze sitting around in the cold wind with nothing to do, and end up deciding to head back early. What I wanted was a romantic sunset, the gentle melting sensation of a pale purple sky when the very air around you is like a wine that strips a woman of her reason. You like movies? I asked her. At the entrance to the Karatsu shopping arcade was a movie theater. They were showing in cold blood. They should have called it the ruined picnic. Yes, the angel said. Look what they've got on. You've heard of it, haven't you? Mr. Know-it-all. The Fatal Bluff. No. It's based on a book by a man named Truman Capote. It's one of the great masterpieces of our time. And so, because I wanted to be on the beach at sunset, we ended up watching a film that definitely wasn't made for 17-year-old couples looking forward to their first kiss. It was a faithful portrait, in documentary style, of two men who lived miserable lives, massacred an entire family, and eventually died in the electric chair. The actors who played these characters had missing teeth, the film was in black and white, the strangulation scenes were more realistic than they needed to be and made even me look away once or twice, and the theater itself had torn, beat up seats and smelled like a toilet. In Cold Blood, the ultimate in gruesome true crime stories lasted a full two hours and forty minutes. The angel kept covering her eyes and whispering, oh, no, or I can't believe it. It wore her out. I myself was so overwhelmed with fatigue and regret that I couldn't think of anything to say to her afterward. Shall we have our lunch now? She said when we arrived at the windblown beach. From her basket she took some sandwiches wrapped in aluminum foil, cheese, ham, egg, and vegetable, with parsley on the side and little moist hand towels to use as napkins. There was fried chicken, too. The pieces of chicken had foil wound around them to make them easier to eat, and were tied with pink ribbons. Looks great. I said in a hearty voice, but the shock of seeing in cold blood still remained, and I felt as if my mouth, my esophagus, and my stomach were lined with sandpaper. I stuffed my cheeks with a sandwich anyway. There was a strong wind. Far out at sea white caps were tossing to and fro and from time to time the sand swirled up around us so that we had to cover our faces and close the picnic basket. That movie was something, wasn't it? She said, pouring me a cup of tea from the thermos. Pretty tiring, you mean? Sort of, yes. Sorry. Why? Making you watch a movie like that. Some date, eh? But it's a masterpiece, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I read in a magazine, anyway. I wonder if we need things like that, though. Hm. I wonder if we need masterpieces like that. What do you mean? It's a true story, right? Yeah, it actually happened. Why do they have to go and make a movie out of it, though? I already know. Know what? I know there's cruelty in the world. Vietnam, and things like... Well, the Nazi concentration camps, but I don't see why they have to make movies about them. What's the point? I had no answer for that, though I understood what she was saying. What answer could you possibly have for a pair of fawn-like eyes asking you why people had to go out of their way to see something ugly or depraved? Kazuko Matsui was a gentle and beautiful girl raised in a loving environment. Maybe the world depicted in Capote's story was right next door, maybe it was necessary to take a good look at these things, but, in the end, what really mattered to her was, as she herself put it, living life like the sound of Brian Jones's harpsichord. We left the wind to see behind. We hadn't even eaten most of the sandwiches, let alone thought about having a kiss. That's how 1969 